In this video series, we conclude the Metallica Bass Rig Trilogy by looking at every bass, amplifier, and effects pedal Robert Trujillo has ever had. In this first installment of Rob's career, we take a look at his formative years on the West Coast with ST, Infectious Grooves, and Ozzy Osbourne. And in part two, we cover his entire career in Metallica, and I'll be telling you everything you've ever wanted to know about his 35 plus Warwick basses, and his story in Metallica. Let's do this. Born on October 23rd, 1964 in Santa Monica, California, Robert Trujillo was originally named as Roberto, what was it? Roberto Agustin Miguel Santiago Simon Trujillo Veracruz <laughs> Kazoo. Okay, thank you. Rob was born to a young couple in their 20s and explained he had the good fortune of growing up with parents at an age where they were appreciating music. Many bands and genres could be heard within the household from the Beatles to Motown, James Brown and the Rolling Stones, but also Beethoven and classical music. My parents were like sponges when it came to music, he declared. They weren't necessarily gravitating to one style. You could find jazz in the household, Bing Crosby or Frank Sinatra, but you'd also get Led Zeppelin in that mix too. That's what I was surrounded by. Rob joined his first band around about the age of 14. He and some buddies would swap between drums, bass and guitar. One of the group would introduce Rob to the music of Jaco Pistorius, whom Rob would admire for years to come. Originally, Rob set his sights on being a drummer or a keyboard player, calmly stating how cool they looked on stage. Because of his living situation in a very small apartment, Rob was unable to lug a heavy piano up the stairs or play the drums because of the noise. Fortunately, by the age of 15, Rob would have some luck on behalf of his father's friend who gave him a Harmony hollow body bass, which did not need an amplifier. Robert would recall the action was completely off the neck. He would also draw inspiration from his father, who had previously played flamenco guitar as a hobby, using different strumming and finger techniques. Rob played this bass for about a year, getting used to the instrument and playing scales and the like, eventually moving on to a Fender copy with rubber strings, again without an amplifier. During this period, Rob was still playing with his school bandmates in various incarnations, focusing more on rock genres like Rush, Black Sabbath, and Ozzy Osbourne. I think they call that foreshadowing. He explained in an interview for Bass Players Only, My first playing experience really was in rock, even though I was listening to and obsessed with fusion and going to the fusion shows. Finally, Rob would get his hands on a working amplifier and pair that up with a Fender Precision followed by a Jazz and a Gibson SG. Although the basses were knockoffs, he shared, I got what I could afford. A hobby Rob and his father would routinely enjoy was fixing up secondhand musical equipment and selling it on. Around 19 years old, Rob had bought himself an Ampeg SVT head with an 8x10 cabinet for $300. He and his father redid the upholstery with the intention of selling it on. Using the proceeds from the SVT rig, Rob bought himself an Ibanez Musician bass with a PV amplifier. It's unclear whether that's the head, combo or cabinet. And this was his first real rig and the start of his professional career. Sharing his experience in an interview with Metallica So What magazine, I didn't realise how great the SVT was till later in life when I actually now play Ampegs. It was so ugly. It was just really an ugly amp. We refinished it with tweed material, like a potato sack. It looked crazy, but cool. Rob would spend the next few years woodshedding his shops at backyard parties before moving on to the Dick Grove School of Music, where he also spent time playing with top 40 artists, but felt like he had exhausted that avenue. I was playing in four or five different projects, just trying to absorb it all. After a few years of that, I finally realised that I got on my feet wet playing the circuit and doing the life thing, but I wasn't really learning. I had a limit. I wanted to go beyond that. Soon afterwards, high school friend Rocky George would introduce Rob to the likes of Mike Muir. Rob remarked how it all came together. I hooked up with ST in 1989. I was really good friends with Rocky George, their guitar player. Rocky was the one that got me into ST and I auditioned for the band. I thought it would be this massive audition with all these different players. But they were like, if you want the gig, you got the gig. The next thing you know, I'm in Europe with ST opening for Anthrax. Upon joining ST, Rob shared he started playing a Tobias bass. However, during the early performances, we see him using an Ibanez musician. 
And during the European tour, footage shows Rob playing what is believed to be a fretless Music Man Stingray 5 string, of which he did admit to later on in the interview. In addition to this, you can also see him play fretted rays like in this picture, but it's hard to say for certain when looking at these videos. Let's face it, they're blurry potatoes. Returning back to the Tobias, Rob commented, When I started touring with ST, I started playing a Tobias. I had that Ibanez bass. I got bored with the way it looked and I cut it up and I made it look kind of like what would have been the hip bass at the time. Two days after it was finished, someone stole it. So all I had was a fretless and I played fretless for a year. It was a nice custom Music Man fretless. My friend Steve McGrath, who now plays with Billy Idol, was already playing Tobias. He said, we're gonna get you a custom five string. They were beautiful. These were expensive basses. And I ordered my first real Tobias custom bass at that time because he felt bad for me. And he goes, we're gonna get you something good. So I got the Tobias. He continues the story and good news everyone. He gets the bass back after the perp finds God. Los Angeles, am I right? In October, 1989, the fourth ST album Controlled by Hate, Feel Like Shit, Deja Vu was released, with the bass credit listed to Stymie. An interview of Louder Sound asked Rob, who is Stymie? Well, there's a lot of reasons for Stymie, he responded. I didn't actually choose the name, it was inherited. So you'd have to ask Mike Muir about that. Although Rob toured the album and performed in the music videos, he was not a member of the band at the time of the album's recording. Bass duties were reportedly handled by Rocky George and Mike Clark. The Ibanez musician likely appears in 1989's Waking the Dead music video, where we catch a few glimpses. Before we move out of 1989, I need to mention the beginning of Infectious Grooves. This group was created by Mike Muir and Robert after he joined ST, focusing more on musical freedom and light-hearted humour rather than the strict and serious ST sound. Additionally, Adam Siegel of Excel and Dean Pleasance took guitar duties, with Stephen Perkins of Jane's Addiction on drums. Infectious Grooves was treated on par with ST, and the two would regularly tour together, necessitating in two exhaustive sets per night. Regarding Robert's amplifier setup, during domestic US ST shows in 1989, we can see Rob using an SVT2 Pro with an 8x10. Whilst on tour in Europe, he most likely played Loner Gear, but the bass rig in this video kind of resembles Warwick if the logos were on the opposite side. The rig has two unnamed heads, two 4x10s, and two 2x15s. Light's Camera Revolution was released in July 1990, with two anthemic music video releases. You Can't Bring Me Down, which featured Rob's hacked up Ibanez musician, fitted with PJ pickups, gold hardware, and a whammy bar, the equally catchy Send Me Your Money, or now called I Saw Your Mummy, according to ST's official YouTube channel, had Rob playing his custom fretless five-string Stingray. The custom five-string Blue Tobias returns again on the video for Alone, as well as a new promotional video for War Inside My Head, which was originally recorded on the 1987 album Join the Army. Here we can see the bass in daylight, with three pot controls and two single coil pickups. On stage is a PV 2x15 and possibly a Hartke 4x10. His rack looks like it's sitting on the bottom left of the picture, but it's not clear enough to make out. Rob would also comment that the intro to You Can't Bring Me Down was recorded on a fretless and took influence from Jacko's melodies. Following this, Infectious Grooves released their debut album, The Play That Makes Your Booty Groove, in 1991. Coincidentally, Ozzy Osbourne was recording his own album, No More Tears, at Devonshire Studios in Los Angeles at the same time. Ozzy ended up collaborating on the single Therapy. We thought it'd be great to ask Ozzy if he would sing on one of our songs. And you know, we hadn't heard anything, but a week later he just kind of storms into the control room. He's like, where's that song? And we set up the mic and he ended up singing the chorus on a song called Therapy. And Ozzy demands that Infectious Grooves tours with him on his Theater of Madness tour. Rob Beam, that Ozzy, really enjoyed the music of Infectious Grooves and offered us a support slot on the Theater of Madness tour. The label didn't want us on that tour, but Ozzy did, and he single-handedly fought for us to be on it. So we ended up opening for him. It was a dream come true. More on Ozzy coming up. The therapy music video soon followed, and Rob used a six string to buy a space, decorated with the band's prehistoric mascot, Sarasipius, and nickname Uno Mas. 
Experience yeah, record. Out. I'll bust you up. Okay. Additionally, the video Punk It Up shows Rob playing a brand new Tobias basic bass. This one differs from his custom with five pot controls and different wood options. Yet another Tobias bass would arrive following the 1992 release of ST6 studio album The Art of Rebellion. A purple six string Tobias with a cartoon on it was cited on the music video Nobody Hears. And in I Wasn't Meant to Feel This, Asleep at the Wheel, we get a closer look at this bass. With that said, when you listen to the record, you'll most likely hear a fretless being played. Oh, and who could forget the infectious grooves making an appearance on 1992's Inchino Man. The juice. No, 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 the juice. No, the juice. Still Psycho after all these years followed up as the seventh studio album released by ST in 1993. It essentially comprises re-recordings of the original 1983 ST and 1987's Join the Army. Mike Muir decided to re-release these tracks on a new record label to ensure the royalties were correctly distributed. The hit single Institutionalized also got a makeover with a new video, and Rob goes old school using his hacked up Ibanez musician. Ampeg amplifiers continue to be seen on the ST tour in the US and Europe around 1993, with two to four 8x10 cabinets and three SVT2 Pros off stage. Infectious were also busy releasing their follow up album Sarasipius Arc. Two music videos were released Party Without Freaks and I hate you better. However, neither feature Rob playing any basses, just an ukulele. ST's eighth album will be the last to include Rocky George on guitar and Robert Trujillo on bass. In a video for Love vs Loneliness, a new Tobacco Burst five string Tobias classic debuts. Not long after this, the cracks started to appear in ST. Rob will caution, we were working so hard, we were touring all the time. When we weren't touring, we were making an album. That was hard work we'd do with our shows. I think it became very taxing on everyone in the band and it created tension. Sometimes the tension could stir up resentment with your bandmates. This tension would occasionally erupt into violent outbursts, with Rob admitting he was a loose cannon and that some physical fights could have gone really badly. When I first started doing this with Suicidal, I wasn't as balanced. And I was a loose cannon a couple times. There was some fights. Could have gone really, really bad. I mean, there was even a fight on stage with Metallica. Mm -hmm. When Metallica was playing with my guitar player, Rocky, we were like best friends. Twice we got in these brawls, and one of them was in on stage during the Metallica set. When we were touring with them in 1993. I body slammed him and I almost knocked over Hetfield's guitars. Mike Muir also describes his resentment at the time. We were opening up for Metallica, playing in front of 20,000 people, and I was absolutely miserable. The manager would say, The bottom line is, it doesn't matter, as long as you're selling records. And when he said that, a light bulb went off in my head, and I said, You know what? It does matter. Sometimes it's hard, but it's time to take a step back and reevaluate everything. Infectious Grooves, on the other hand, remain busy, with the release of their third album, Groove Family Psycho. Two video releases followed, which showed a new direction in Rob's gear. Violent and Funky introduced his sixth Tobias, this time in red. This bass can be considered one of the most infamous alongside Ozzy Osbourne. It's typically stylized with an oval driving sticker which says Max on the top left of the body and Dogtown Skates logo on the upper horn. It also appears the stock Bartolini pickups were replaced with single coil EMGs. EMG plays a massive part in Rob's sound and I'll cover that in full in part 2. The follow up video Cousin Randy, do not watch this video if you're scared of clowns in any way, you have been warned. Is also the first time we see Rob use Fernandez basses. Again, another infamous company which follows Rob into Metallica. The bass featured was an APB 8 string in black with gold hardware. Rob explains the move to Fernandez in the Ace of Bass article. Tobias split up and got bought by Gibson, so the Luthiers from Tobias ended up at a place called Fernandez. Fernandez made me basses for a couple of years by those same Luthiers. Released in August 1994, a Bass Player magazine article confirms much of what we've already seen. The Tobias Classic 5 was made of Babinga, Wenge and Alder. Presumably this refers to the red bass. 
followed by a Tobias Basic 5 string with blue finish flame maple body, a custom painted Tobias Basic 6 string called Uno Mas, a fretless Basic 6 string, a Fernandez 8 string, the APB, and Music Man Stingray 5 string, which is most likely the one on the cover. His bass rig would also include a TC electronic chorus pedal, which was supplemented with a rack mounted DBX160X compressor and BBE411 Sonic Maximizer, followed by a splitter box, which fed up to six brand new Ampeg SVT3 heads. Each head powers one SVT 8x10 DL cabinet. The article also included Rob using Dean Markley strings with a heavy B, most likely from Ernie Ball. Dean Markley would officially endorse Rob by the year 2000, stating on their website that he used Medium SR2000, and Rob continued to use their strings up until 2009. In the studio, Rob used a variety of Ampeg and SWR amps for a clean mic amp sound, while his gritty sounds are obtained with a PV5150 guitar amp. He also takes a direct line and blends it with the mic amp tracks for the final mix. A final word about infectious grooves before we move on. In 1996, Rob continued to use the SVT3 with 8x10 cabinets. Whilst not technically leaving infectious grooves, he would relinquish his bass duties in favour of his new job with Ozzy Osbourne. Hey, are you enjoying the video so far? Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon so you'll be notified when part two is released. If there's a bass rig you want to see, you let me know in the comments down below. Back to the show. Replacing Giza Butler of all bassists, Rob had pretty huge shoes to fill. As previously mentioned, Rob had already met Ozzy in 1991 whilst recording with Infectious Grooves. Rob affirmed, A few years later, I got the phone call from Sharon Osbourne to come down and audition. I auditioned and I got the gig. The rest is history. I did seven years of Ozzy, and I'll never forget those years being on the roller coaster with him. I got a call from uh, Sharon and Ozzy regarding uh, an audition to come in. You know, they, uh, they needed a bass player, so I stepped in there and uh, it was a dream for me. You know, once again, I grew up playing backyard parties, you know, 15, 16 years old, playing Black Sabbath, Ozzy Osbourne songs. To get up on the big stage and to look over and see, you know, the Godfather up there rocking next to me was so special, you know, and, and that always happened up till, you know, uh, um, recent dates, you know, just look over and go, man, I'm playing Iron Man <laughs> with, with a man. During the early performances, his basses didn't change very much. Rob's debut of Ozzy came at the very first Ozfest in 1996, primarily using his classic Red Tobias. Unfortunately for us, when Rob joined Ozzy, most of his amplifiers and rack equipment were stowed away behind the set production for most of the performances. From this point on, Rob would slowly transition into using Fernandez basses, as the luthiers from Tobias had now moved to Fernandez. According to a Blabbermouth article, Trujillo had an existing promotional deal with Fernandez for being able to use his likeness in advertising. Fernandez was given Robert a pile of custom bass guitars. I would take that to me, most of his basses are custom and you're not going to find them in any Fernandez catalogue. So make of that what you will. You may even see his signature on top of some of the headstocks. Oh, and don't ask about that, some things never change. Another Fernandez bass debuts at this time before being seen in Metallica. Oh, 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 and speaking of Metallica, I found this really great bass exercise I'd love for you to try at home with. Extend your right index finger and retract and point and retract and point. Very good and point. Keep going and good. Great. Now, if you reach over and hit the subscribe button, you will be notified when the Metallica video is released. Notably seen in Robert's performances in Metallica, the Fernandez Gravity 5 in Black Sparkle and Black Hardware has a crest-like image on the back of the base, which I haven't been able to identify. I mean, I haven't lost too many nights sleep over it, but uh, if you know, let me know, okay? As well as a shiny Mexico flag sticker. I guess it's holographic or something, but here in the UK, we call those old football stickers or soccer stickers shinies. Anyway, Rob would also appear in the Fernandez catalogs using various custom bases. Like this one in 1997, using a Gravity 5 with PJ pickups. This is the only time I've come across it. Or in the 1998 edition with a silver 5 string. This time adorned with a sticker just below the pickups which says Lowrider in front of the Mexican flag. I also found this on Wikipedia which I thought was entertaining. The specifications and complete history of Rob's personally owned and stage played Fernandez basses, that's a full stop there, by most accounts is still a mystery. Until now.
Not now, now. Later now. Part two now. Later in part two. Part two, Fernandez bases. Okay? Okay. Not now. Around the year 2000, there was another sighting of Tobias inspired bases. This time, a black MTD base. Thanks to my pal Rock Nimit G for spotting that one. As Tobias bases were bought out in 1992, previous owner Michael Tobias left to create his own workshop in 1994 under the name Michael Tobias Design or MTD. The black MTD can be seen very clearly in the music video for Dreamer in 2000 and on the subsequent tour in 2001. The video Gets Me Through was released in October 2001 and shows Rob performing with three Ampeg 8x10 cabinets, powered by two Ampeg CLs and a 1980s MTI era SVT with rocker switches. The Red Tobias Classic and his original Blue Custom also resurface at this time. The Blue Custom now sports an infectious groove sticker on the top left of the base. There was also a natural looking Tobias which made a very brief appearance contributing to the writing process of Osborne's eighth studio album Down to Earth, Rob obtained three writing credits, which was something Rob had always dreamt of. The challenge for me with Ozzy was that I wanted to be able to write some songs for the guy. After about six years, it happened. I had three songs on the last Ozzy album. I accomplished what I wanted with Ozzy. I toured my ass off with him. I managed to get three solid, heavy, cool songs on his album. For me to record them, and to hear his voice on a song that I created was a dream of mine. It happened and then it was time to move on. Speaking of recording, Rob was also credited on the controversial 2002 reissues of Diary of a Madman and Blizzard of Oz, replacing original bassist Bob Daisley's bass tracks. When asked about the hubbub, Rob remarked, well, that was a weird situation. I didn't even know what we were doing. I was employed by Sharon and Ozzy at the time, so I just did what I was told to do. Leaving Ozzy Osbourne on a high note, one of Rob's crowning moments was playing live at the Badokan in Japan with Ozzy in 2002. This concert had a grand display of all of Robert's gear and included the Red Tobias, a new purple Fernandez with a Hinano sticker, it's a beer from Tahiti and Tahiti is a regular surf spot for Rob. Trust me, it's purple, not green. Take it from someone who knows, it's purple, not green the Black Sparkle Fernandez, and the Glossy Black MTD. The Badokan show is unusual as we get a brilliant clear view of all of Robert's cabinets, which consists of three Ampeg 8x10s and two 4x12 high watt cabinets. A Bass Player Magazine article in 2003 would later confirm Rob using two SVT3s for tone, one SVT4 for power, and high watt 4x12 half stacks. It does appear Rob was endorsed by high watt, but it's unclear what gear he was using with high watt at the time. Following a lull in the Osborne work schedule, Rob collaborated with Alison Chain's guitarist Jerry Cantell on his solo album Degradation Trip. When asked about what he used on the record, Rob responded I was mainly using Fenders for Jerry's record. I had a red Tobias which was the main base in terms of the active electronics for the heavier stuff. In a second interview, he later added, I also use flat wound strings on a Dan Electro. Unclear which model. That music called for specific instruments. He then appeared on the music video for the song Angra Rising using the very same red Tobias. Recording alongside them bandmate Zach Wilde and Black Label Society in 2002, Rob contributed to the album 1919 Eternal racking up bass credits for the songs Demise of Sanity and Life, Birth, Blood, Do. He also accompanied the band on the road using a black with white pickguard custom Fender Precision with a wee sticker of Andrew the Giant near the bridge as well as a second custom Fender Precision in white with two black racing stripes. The Red Tobias Classic also appeared, Dogtown sticker and Ooh. I subtly hinted earlier that Rob had already met Metallica in 1993 and 1994. This would have been the first time Metallica had met Rob. Around 2001, Kirk Hammett had just gotten into surfing. One of the Metallica crew members and Kirk were on the hunt for new surf spots, and they decided to give like-minded surfer Robert a call. They asked if Rob could show them some cool new surf spots in Southern California, and he did. Rob then spent a week with the pair and cheered. 
We really connected, and it wasn't like we were connecting musically. We were actually connecting as surfers first. And so when it came to the time for Metallica to audition new bass players, guess whose name came up? Rob was perplexed. I'm in Tahiti on this surf trip, and I check my voicemail, and it's Lars and Kirk saying, Hey man, come down. Come down and jam with us. And I was like, oh man, this is cool. So I had actually gotten the call. Rob raced up to Metallica HQ not long after, joining the band in the studio and watching the process unravel around him. And the following day, the day where he was meant to play, well, he was nursing a thundering headache with no thanks to Lars Ulrich. And then it was time to audition. Coming up in part two, we conclude Robert's story in Metallica. So if you haven't subscribed, do that already and click the bell icon so you will be notified when that video is released. We cover every one of his 35 plus Warwick bases, plus Fernandez, Nash, Rickenbacker, Yamaha, Zon, and his effects pedals, some of which may very well surprise you. If you're new to the channel, can I invite you to come and watch my Les Claypool series or Justin Chancellor series? Both are very popular and I'd love to share this with you. Links are in the description. In the meantime, you can find the show notes linked down below for a full comprehensive list of everything Rob has ever used in his career. And as always, if there's a bass player you'd like to see on the channel, you let me know in the comments down below. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in part two.